now I want to finally give the floor to Christina, uh, who is our first speaker and will talk about all things uh, creativity in UX research. So uh, Christina has over 15 years of experience in user research um, and has a background in organizational psychology. And she works as an independent consultant to support tech companies with uh, customer insights and to design products. Um, some of her uh, client portfolio includes companies like Babylon Health, Just Eat, and many more. Um, so Christina will talk about how we can all be creative in UX research. Uh, so uh, welcome her on stage and take it away, uh, Christina. Hey, thanks, Anna. Um, Firstly, thanks everyone for being here this evening. Um, I hope you can see me. I'm going to be sharing my screen now. Um, do let me know if it doesn't come up. Cool. I hope you can see my screen. If not, let me know. Great. So, um, yes, as Anna mentioned, I'll be talking about different types of research methods that can help you be a bit more creative in your day-to-day -day practice. Um, it is pretty much a two-way conversation. So if you have any thoughts or comments or have any questions, do leave them um, in the chat box and then hopefully we can come back to those at the end of the talk. So I want to start with a question for everyone this evening. Um, how many people have watched or heard of a British drama called Line of Duty? And if you have, if you don't mind giving me a bit of thumbs up on the reaction using the reaction tool by that really great just so I have an idea we got anyone okay I can't for some reason I can't see the reaction so <laughs> I'm not sure if anyone has seen any um Anna do you, do you see any I don't, but uh, maybe this means that no one has. knows. Okay. Or... <laughs> okay, fine. Okay. You can great. also add it to the chat if you're uh, familiar. I, I see oh. one person saying me in the chat. So okay, yes, else... add it in the chat. You haven't seen it? Great. I'll just give it. I'll just give it a few seconds for people to. Okay. Oh. The question is, if anyone has heard about or watched the British drama Line of Duty, which, if you have, you might have recognized the scene on the, on the slide at the moment oh lots of no yes no next okay great oh very interesting different type of audience and demographics no okay perfect cool well thanks everyone for um taking the chance to let me know so i'm just going to explain a little bit like why i'm starting with this british drama firstly line of duty is a british police procedural drama about an anti-corruption unit um called ac12 who investigate um, internal corruption within the police force. The drama is really um, known for the interrogation scenes. So they usually start with a long beep to signal the start of these interviews. And the scenes are gripping edge of the seats and always trying to catch the suspect out. And if you can picture this, um, as gripping as the drama is, it is a very scripted conversation. Um, imagine this, the format is pretty much the police ask the questions, um, you give me an answer. The interviewer at the end of the day is directing the flow of this conversation. Does this sound familiar um, to anyone? <laughs> and will you now picture how we do our user research interview? Um, if you can imagine, it is pretty much the same. We, as the researcher, are directing the flow of the conversation. We're asking certain questions and anticipating answers. We're trying to script a conversation. So firstly, I'm not suggesting um, user, insert, user interviews resemble an anti-corruption police drama or discounting the merits of what we do with our interview techniques. But we often do have to think about the types of questions we want to um, get answers to. So it is a planned session, a very structured or procedural even. So today I just want to take the chance to show you how you can be creative in your research techniques to get more insight out of your research that doesn't rely on this sort of sterile um, police drama kind of scenario. So I did say the word creative and you might be asking, uh, do I need to be creative? And if every time if someone says the word creative, this is how I respond. It's like scream, I'm not creative. Um, I'm not a designer, I'm a researcher. So I just wanna encourage us to think about this question slightly differently. What if I reframe my previous question on creativity to a question like this? 
do you have a growth mindset? Do I have a growth mindset? I hope and I think the answer to this question would be a resounding yes. Otherwise, you wouldn't be spending today um, on this meetup call to hear about different techniques or different ways of working within the research community. So um, I just hope everyone can be keep an open mind um, and give these techniques a go. So I hope everyone's feeling nice and relaxed and ready to learn. So um, today I'm going to be uh, start talking about three broad categories of research techniques. And some of these are quite interesting because I know Karen will go into this um, in her part of the session. Because I know when people signed up um, to this meetup, some of you have shared what kind of research methods you have tried beyond the research um, interviews. So some of these might be familiar to you already. Um, some might be, it might be a bit of a refresher. Some might not be as familiar to you. So I hope there's a bit of everything for everyone today. So the first one is about um, contextual or situational research. So a lot of us are probably very familiar or have heard about this method. It could be ethnography. It could be what we call home visit. Um, so whatever we call it, it's where we immerse ourselves in the participant's natural environment. And as I said, this could be at the participant's home in the form of a home visit. So this is a photo um, of some work I did with Just Eats where I spent quite many evenings um, looking at how people order the takeaway, waiting for the delivery to come. So I spent a lot of time um, at people's home observing what do they do between ordering um, and the food arriving? How do they set up the table? What do they do? Do they watch TV? Do they listen to music? What happens? What kind of conversations do they have? And how do they get the table ready for a meal? Um, this could also be at someone's office doing job shadowing. So this was from a day I spent at a processing centre um, in a UK government department, understanding what type of paperwork happens, what goes on when some when someone see piece of paperwork, how do they make decisions, who makes those decisions, what are the steps involved. So it's quite detailed in that sense. But um, whatever, oh, sorry, it's going quicker. So whatever um, format it is, whether it's a home visit or an office visit, how do we make it a success? So I think, firstly, it's important to think about the environment you'll be going in. Um, so not everyone on your team may be able to come on a visit with you. Um, it might be you and another person. In fact, it could be quite intimidating um, to a participant if like six or eight people show up at the door trying to um, see how they live or something like that. So not everyone will be um, able to join you on this visit. So when you're planning the visit and during the visit, really think about what you can bring back to help the team understand and get a sense of what the environment was like when you were there. So um, this is when a photo list is really handy. So take photos of the environment. Uh, take photos of participants doing certain tasks. So in the example of the um, home visit in, a live, um, in the takeaway example, so think about what the living room is like. How do they set up the living room? What's the kitchen like? Where do they store the plates? Where do they put the condiments away? Where do they eat? Is it around a dining area? Is it in front of the TV? So how do you enrich those kind of details for someone who weren't able to be there? And if you were in a... Um, office so think about where how their monitor is set up do they have multiple monitors um do they where do they walk the most what's the path um, where do they congregate where do people have a chat and do they have piles of notebooks next to them with all the cheat notes and shortcuts telling them how to do processes so think about all those things um that might come into handy um and i just saw a question what if the person in home visit wants no photos that is absolutely fine um, often I do let them know that there is a chance to opt out um, and you do have to ask for consent of all those things and in, as part of your recruitment you can also make it really clear that um, there will be certain sort of expectations um, probably not the right word but like certain agreements um, what you want to do so and, and that's a chance for them to sort of have a chat with you as well um, yeah so just making sure you have all those things covered beforehand and if you're doing this, uh, you can also think about when you're doing this task remotely, it can be adopted remotely. You can use the same list um, and ask the participants to send you a list of photos. Right. Okay, so also um, think about the type of task um, or activities you want to observe. So what, um, what sort of things would really help you 
get insights into someone's lives. But we all know with real life situation, um, things gonna not turn out the way you planned. So just be open minded and curious. Um, often if it's sort of you maybe you have an idea of how it should go. Um, the task should go and the participant do something else that you don't expect. That's probably the interesting bit because it's not what you were expecting. That's the bit you can learn a lot more about. So just be um, open-minded and curious and explore those um, interesting parts. And learn like an apprentice. Um, what do I mean by this? So you're really learning from the participants how they do certain tasks and activities. They're showing you the ropes. They are the experts. They are showing you their lives. So as this is in user research interviews, there are no right or wrong answers when it comes to home visit or job shadowing. Um, just have that apprentice mindset. Be curious to learn and you'll get the most out of this experience. And finally, be a good guest. You'll be invited into someone's home or workplace where it's often a very intimate um, environment. So respect the rules, cultures, environment. Um, and as you would in any research interview sessions, build that rapport really early on. So um, I mentioned a little bit beforehand when we were talking about the photo list that of course you can adapt it to uh, a remote environment. So, and there might still be some limitations in place that means you can't go to someone's home physically or visit someone's office um, may not be appropriate right now. Or in fact, um, you may want to reach different geographies or locations and some places are a bit hard to travel and you have limited time or budget you're not able to reach those places, but you still want to have a good coverage across the country, for example. This is when adopting this method remotely is really helpful. Um, it can still work. So how can you do that? You can get participants to share the screens with you. You can also get participants to send the photos in with a photo list afterwards with remote shoes, whether that's email, WhatsApp, Dropbox, where share files. Um, they can even use a Google form and then attach the files onto a Google Drive. Whatever method um, or tools you choose, just make sure it works with your organization um, data protection. Again, similarly, you can get participants to record themselves doing a task um, and get them to send it to you using any of the tools that is appropriate for your company. Also consider getting participants to complete sentiment surveys when they have finished a study. So how did they feel when they were doing certain activities? What was their reflection? Was it a happy experience? Was it a negative experience? What kind of scale that would help you gauge how they felt? And think about scheduling a follow-up interviews. So speak to participants the next day and get them to share what they did and maybe even go through some of the photos together so you get a richer environment of what's happened and go through some of the survey response because survey is, at the end of the day, a self-assessment tool. So it is a bit biased towards um, and no, um, towards myself and not everyone will have the same definition. If I say a three and Anna said a three, it could be a completely different meaning. So just to make sure, so that's always a good idea, just to have a quick chat about what some of those answers mean. Right, the second set of methods I want to share is on co-design. So firstly, I think there is um, perhaps sometimes a misconception or misconclusion that when we say the word co-design, it must be like, oh, to do with Legos and being really serious and playing with things really hands-on and be really creative. Um, it is not necessary about Lego. It is beyond that. So co-design to me, it's a method you can use to unlock individuals' mental models. So how do they think about certain topic? What is the mental representation of a concept? Um, so it's unlocking, understanding how they think about certain things a little bit more than what you can get out of conversations. So how do you do that? Um, you can co-design with um, participants um, using paper prototyping. And in fact, we know that designers do this already. It's low fidelity and it's very hands-on in that sense. Um, so this is not about, you know, understanding the finesse of the design, but rather understanding the hierarchy of information, understanding what's important to participants and why. So let me briefly walk through the example I have here on the screen. So this is um, in relation to um, takeaway food delivery information you would see on your phone or on the app. So um, what happens is I got all the different elements that I think might be interesting or we know that's already currently available to um, customers or cut out in individual bits. So there are food photos, there are menu, 
um, their ratings, hygiene rating, customer reviews, all the, all the different things. Um, and I got participants to lay out the information that would make sense to them, basically design the page together. And then um, got them to put a dot. You might see some orange dots throughout the screen. And that is to highlight what are the most important information to them. And then got them to vote or write down what their absolute favorite was. And I said this at the start, this is not about the finesse of the design, but rather understanding how they think. Because after this, we run the research study, you'll have multiple of these uh, prototypes and you can spread them across the room and you can make comparisons across all the different participant responses and look for patterns and trends as you do as, and as you would um, when you do your research interviews. So it's just a different way to spot pattern and trends using this method. Another co-design method is cognitive maps. Um, this is where you get a visual representation of someone's mental model on a process or on a concept. So in this example, I'm using Venn diagram. Why am I using this Venn diagram? Because I was speaking to couples at the time in relationships, um, in various lengths of relationship, whether they just started cohabiting um, or whether they've been together for many years or um, with different, um, I guess, family arrangement, or maybe they have stepchildren or children from previous relationships, whatever the format is. Um, I wanted to understand how couples share the what, what they sh share together, whether that's um, physical space or finances. And I wanted to understand what do they have separate from as a couple unit. So in the Venn diagram, um, the shared bit are what uh, couples pay and share together. That's the overlapping bit. And then an individual circle are the separate activities that they do. So um, so just really quickly, this Venn diagram on the left of the screen, you, you can see the overlapping bit is actually all the physical space that they shared. So they've got bedroom, living room, kitchen, bathroom, and all the finances are separate in this instance. They just do a bank transfer to each other. But on the other example, perhaps is a more established um, relationship. They have all the, the share bit, uh, all the commonality, uh, all the bills, um, rent, electric, um, gas, food, things that they do together. And then a separate bit uh, themselves going out and socializing with their friends. So um, this is just a really interesting way to unlock how people in different types of uh, relationships or living arrangements or different lifestyles and um, think about their money and um, their relationship so um, it's just a really great example and other examples you could adapt some of this is to use um, cognitive maps for understanding internal processes so you can get people to map out the timeline how long they you know what other steps in doing certain tasks and what their processes were like as well so how do we make um, co-designs really sing and work um, I think when, again, when you say co-design to participants, it can be quite daunting with, they don't know what it means. Um, it can be present, like presenting them with a blank piece of paper. So what you can do in your planning um, and during the session is to really think about what you can do to help reduce the stress and anxiety um, from these participants. Will you be doing this task with the participants together? So they get, a, you know, so you sort of offload some of their stress. Will you be providing some supporting materials to help them get through the task? So in a way, clear instructions, um, knowing what you're looking at for, or like like in my example with the paper prototyping, get all the materials ready or um, already. Um, whatever ways you can think of to help reduce the stress is really um, participants are often just looking for reassurances and knowing that they're helping you get to the answers as well. So just think about those. And of course, once again, you can adapt um, this method to be remote. And I have done that a lot during the pandemic period. But my key learning is this, um, think about the tools that participants will have easy access to at home. I think when we have um, being part of a design team or a product team, often we over-engineer the task because we get access to maybe some of the fancy tools that people don't get access to out there. And participants don't have those access um, at home easily with the tools. So Google Slides, in fact, um, is a really great collaboration tool. Um, a lot of people have those at home and have easy access to. And you can easily set up templates, have um, all the little bits ready um, to go on the slides as template, and people can interact and you can see the screen at the same time. Right, and the final set of research method is on reflection. So I classify these type of methods as particip participants looking inward 
or reflecting on their inner feelings, um, their thoughts and activities, and then sharing them with you as a researcher. So how do we get people to share their deepest thoughts or reflections with us um, when we're doing this research? So let me explain. Um, I think all of us has probably been to the cinema to watch a movie. Um, perhaps maybe not so recently perhaps recently whatever it is you've all probably been to a um, cinema to see a movie and when you go and visit a cinema and watch a film you probably experience a range of emotions as you're watching the movies some emotions are high some are low some are stronger than others and you have a range of thoughts and you can probably relate to the characters you're probably sometimes screaming at them go don't go there that's dangerous or you might you might be crying with the um with the characters because it relates to certain emotions um, in your life and the movies are really clever they you know probe your thoughts um, they pull different reference points that you can relate back to your own life so how do we encourage our participants um, to share those kind of feelings or emotions and experience with us when they're using our products during research sessions a really interesting method that I like using is storyboards. And this of course is a technique and the bread and butter of the film industry. So a storyboard visually maps out how a story will take place. Um, in this example here is from the Jurassic Park, which maybe some of you have also seen. Um, and the, it shows what the characters are doing. It shows what the emotions just the characters are supposed to feel. And if you look at this storyboard on the screen right now, it also zoom out and you can see the dinosaur chasing you. And the next fragment is zooming in and you can see the detail and the emotions of these characters. So it's able to zoom in and zoom out to illustrate um, to you what the story is about. So why do we care about a storyboard at all? Um, because the directors care about this, because then the directors can know how to plan to shoot the scene and what preparation needs to go in place. Um, special effects knows what needs to go happen. Um, costs too many to think about what color or how to dress the characters who re reflect certain part of the um, scene. So how is this relevant to user research? Well, we can also visually represent how the product or feature might work for our users. What will they experience? What will they see? What are the details they will see? How would they be feeling along the way? We only need to provide just enough details to tell a story. We don't need to go overboard like here um, with all the finesse of it, but enough to illustrate how we think a certain feature or product will work for our participant customers. So I'm gonna show you two examples. Um, they're not complete stories. They're fragments of some storyboards I've done in the past, but I just wanted to demonstrate what you can also do with this research method. In this one is really high level. It's really, you know, just sketches in that sense, but it's just enough to tell a story and we're able to put narrations around it. So we know what the characters are doing and perhaps what they're saying and how they feel. And um, you can take place in any medium. <laughs> Here's a fragment of a storyboard I've done um, on post-it or sticky notes. So as you can see, it doesn't have to be like what the film industry do. And whatever format you choose to express the storyboard in, um, I've picked up over the years, it's really important to ask a single question. How is this story relevant to you and why? And how does this question help our participants? Well, this allows our participants to immerse themselves into the story and the visualization and see if they can imagine themselves living out that story, whether the story aligns with their daily lives or not. Participants will also be able to tell you um, whether it suits their lifestyles or perhaps some details we've overlooked in our design. Um, in fact, last time I just used this a couple of months ago, one of the first thing the participants said, was like, that's, you're missing this key bit in the story. And we're all like, oh, this light bulb moment. Yes, of course. How could we have overlooked this? Um, of course, certain participants will, you know, it doesn't fit into their lifestyle. So just making sure we have those conversations really key. And storyboard technique is uh, also about the opportunity to give participants to make changes to the story. Um, so think about what additional materials you could have ready um, to make it 
relevant for them. So I'm just putting some examples here. Like you can have speech bubbles, action bubbles. Participants can add them along the way. They can add perhaps showcases of different types of emotions they would feel along the story. Um, what other typical channel or devices they might use the product in. Um, and across, I put across there because that's also really important because as well as adding to the story, it's also about removing parts of the story um, that doesn't make sense to the participants at all. Um, it's sometimes we might have overthought the scenario or the product usage. So it's just about keeping it really um, relevant for the participants. Another technique um, to encourage reflection is the use of pre-session tasks. Some of you probably um, may call this as homework. Um, and this is about getting participants to prepare ahead of the session um, and share some thoughts with you um, before that you speak to them. Um, so this is really good in that you're not putting participants on the spots during the session to give you an answer. It gives them time to think a little bit more um, on what their life is like. And also this gives you time ahead of um, a time ahead of you speaking to them. Um, maybe you can plan your sessions and questions differently to make sure you fit into the lifestyle a bit. So here's an example of a pre-task or homework. Um, this is also relating to uh, food delivery takeaway. So we ask families to keep a food diary for a week. Um, why was this important? We just wanted to know how families eat. We wanted to know if there were any differences in terms of meal times for weekday and weekend, the types of food they eat. And we wanted to know which meals were prepared at home and which ones were most likely to be taken away. So we just wanted to understand the triggers um, and then look across the week. Um, it just um, gave us a much richer um, idea of what the participants were like before we spoke to them. Other examples of pre-tasks include visualization. You can get participants to look for images that they associate with a topic. So what do they think about when I ask them about money? Or what is it about health, well-being, education, whatever it is, what kind of images um, conjure up for them? You can also get them to write a breakup letter. So it helps um, it helps us to identify the pain points and challenges that participants face. So for example, why are you thinking of, of breaking up with your bank? Or why did you move, um, instead of asking them why you moved bank, get them to write a letter of why they left the bank. You can also get participants to take snapshots of photos to understand what a typical is like when they're out and about. It's minimal effort and they can bring it along to the session or submit it to you beforehand. So um, how can we make this a success if you do choose to use um, pre-task or homework? Firstly, give really clear instructions on what the task is about and when they need to send you the information by. Also, just make sure you have enough time um, tailored in the project to get participants to actually do the task. So in the meal plan example I shared, we needed at least a week of um, data for the participants to complete it. And then having uh, days at the end so to buffer it in case we don't receive everything back on time before we go and speak to them. Um, and pre-tasks are actually really great um, when you're short on budget. You might not be able to run a long-term diary study. I know some of you have said that's a common method you've tried to, um, you have used before sometimes you know time is limited you don't have the budget or it's really hard to get participants engagement over a long period of time you might have dropouts but it's relatively easy to ask participants to take some photos or fill a simple diary ahead of this so um i've gone through uh, quite a few methods you might be thinking yep that sounds interesting but what's next so I'm just going to share some tips on how we can make it work. And these are also, you know, lessons I've learned over the years. Um, make sure you plan and time everything. Preparation is key. Um, whatever time you think you need for planning or running the research session, um, double it. And make sure you really try it out beforehand. Um, try out the materials. Have a go at it yourself first or with your team first because you might have missed some critical materials. You might need to make sure your instructions are clear. And when you're trying out as a bonus to you as the researchers, you also get an idea of how it feels to run the session as well. And just make sure you time everything so you have a clear idea of how long a t uh, an activity is going to take. And as with any research, you 
run, um, be clear and think through the demographics and behaviors for the recruitment. So this goes back to a question I addressed at the start. So are participants willing to do a pre-task first? Um, are participants comfortable sharing the meal plans with you? Are they comfortable doing interactive tasks during sessions? Some might prefer, um, you know, conversations instead, and that's totally fine. Are they comfortable with you visiting the home? Do they understand what it means when you have a visitor at home? Um, are, you, are they okay with you taking photos? Just have, just be really clear upfront um, what you're uh, watching out for. Um, and if you're using a recruitment agency, work with work with the agencies. They know the demographics and the characteristics of the people on the database. They might have suggestions on how to brief the participants or how to recruit for these um, type of activities. And you're using your own customer list and recruiting in-house. Be really clear in your comms um, when you send out to customers, what kind of research method it is, what can they expect the activities to be, what the rules of engagements are, and what the time commitments are. Some people might think it's an hour, but it, you know it might take a little bit more than that because there might be activities throughout the week. So just be really clear and set those expectations up front. And question everything. Um, look back at your research objectives and the questions you're trying to get answers to. Is this still the best method? Um, why is this technique better than another? What problems will this um, technique help you solve? There may be other methods that will help you answer the research questions better than the ones I have shared tonight. Um, because these techniques do take time to prepare, um, you have to think about what are the right moments to use these techniques. Um, and just and avoid that temptation just to be creative. Um, these techniques only work if they serve a purpose and help you get better insight. And finally, don't be afraid to try. Um, you know, if things are not going to work maybe the first time, second time, or many times, then that is totally fine. That is the point of learning. Um, and repeating during the tasks. So experiment, um, share any stories you have with the rest of the team or designers and, and think about how you can set up a culture where in your team, you are able to experiment with these techniques. Like how do you have autonomy within your team to suggest and try out these different methods and not always default to a research interviews. And just really remember to have a growth mindset. So I think that's it. Um, I'm happy to continue the conversation um, in the QA or um, in the networking part of this event, or you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, whatever um, method or help works for you. So thanks so much for listening. And thanks, Anna and UX Insight for having me this evening. Thank you, Christina. Uh, there are lots of conversations going in the oh, chat, lots of uh, questions. So uh, I, I think that the topic is uh, really resonating and the examples as well. Uh, I love the Venn diagram example uh, and uh, like how you showed how, how couples were doing the activity. So um, we'll have some uh, minutes for the Q&A. We won't uh, be able to address all the questions also because some of you are already replying to each other's questions and sharing tips. So please uh, keep doing in that um maybe just um a few of them that I noted down. Um, so there was one question about the pre-session tasks uh, mm -hmm. that you talked, we, we also call them homework and sensitizing. So how do you excite or motivate users to participate in these pre-session tasks? Do you have any tips on that? Mm, um, I think it's like, you know, um, <laughs> um, I'll share the one I did recently. Like, do you have kids at home? Do you want to help them <laughs> get better at homework, for example. It's just like, you know, like like any recruitment ads, um, sort of think about what the hook is for the audience you're trying to get. Um, and then just write a really good uh, and clear brief instructions um, and making sure you're always available to answer the questions that they may have. Um, I think sometimes it is a bit daunting if you just email about a um, bunch of instructions and then you go into the ether. So just making sure you're available to answer questions um, and pick up on any points that they're not sure about. 
Yeah, yeah, totally. So like also following kind of the recruitment uh, best practices uh, mm. as well. Um, there was um, also a question about the, the Venn diagram. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe that's more of a clarification. You can elaborate. But there was a question of whether the Venn diagrams were based on the interviews uh, or you made the couples actually feel the Venn diagrams themselves. Like, did you basically create them yourself after the interview? Uh, right. Or was um, it the couples in the moment doing them? Um, it was part of the activities that the couples did. So it's always interesting to see. And you can observe couples' dynamics <laughs> if, if that is relevant to your research um, question. But yes, um, we got, it's part of the, we, um, in that example, maybe I've done like an interview just to get some background and then, and then share that Venn diagram and then got them to fill out themselves. And once again, once you have all the Venn diagrams, you can, you know, analyze the trends. Um, it's always really interesting to see how people fill it out themselves. Yeah, yeah, that was a great example. Um, we also, uh, I'm a bit uh, rushing through the questions uh, because mm -hmm. uh, we are a bit short on time, but um, we also, uh, it was not a question, it was a comment, but I kind of want to turn it into a question. Okay. There was um, a question, uh, there was a comment saying that I feel that preparing co-design sessions are too time consuming compared to other methods for digital products. Maybe for physical products, it can help to give you direction in early design phases. Mm -hmm. I think you also talked about this fact that um it takes time you need to double your time it's quite mm -hmm. time consuming so i maybe you can elaborate on why would you invest your effort into these techniques like why why or when would you do that uh mm -hmm. because they are really time consuming and maybe they they take more effort on you as a researcher or on yeah. the budget as well sure um that's a really good question because I did say, you know, think about the right moments to use these kind of techniques. And I'm just thinking like the example I shared with on the paper prototype example, it was actually done as part of an agile sprint. And we did that because we kind of hit a roadblock. Uh, we weren't getting like particularly deep insights. Um, yes, fine, you can have a prototype and you can observe how people were using the product. But we kind of um, just, yeah, just a bit stuck. Like we weren't moving forward with what we were hearing. So we just thought, why don't we try um, using paper prototype and have those elements ready and get participants to share like fresh what works for them rather than, oh, he's, um, he's a prototype and interact with it. Um, but of course, like the storyboard one, um, we did it, the recent example I did it on was um, before we went to development because we didn't want to, I guess, invest in the wrong thing. Um, we wanted to make sure the concept was sound enough that there was interest from uh, our potential customers to know that they were engaged with a product like that. Um, so I think it is, you know, it really depends on your research question. If it's about pure evaluative usability type questions I you know of course it doesn't really answer using these co-design methods but if it can offer you a fresh perspective and you feel like you're going around in a circle and you don't know but also you don't know enough yet to put something in a prototype maybe that's kind of a sweet spot um I have often think about like you know if you think about the double diamond um design process I have thought about like, is there like a set method? Like, do you just do it in discovery at the top of the diamond? But then it doesn't feel right that we just restrict these methods to a particular part of the process. Yeah, you never need to just follow the framework as it is. You always need to kind of think critically and think mm. what works, what doesn't, how to adapt it uh, yeah. to your uh, circumstances. So I love that. Um, I just see that we had a kind of a comment from Nicole saying, can we raise our hands if we have comments to add to your answers? Um, Nicole, if you would like to contribute, maybe you can unmute yourself and join the, the conversation if you feel like it. I'm not sure if you had a question or if you wanted to uh, kind of share your perspective on the, on I mean, the question. It was sort of a general question. I wasn't sure if since we have a, a smaller group now, if it was going to be more of a discussion or if we should just hang back and wait for your answers. That was really just it. Um, 
Uh, but I will say one thing uh, that, that I originally, uh, going back to the question about how to engage people more, um, I find that with almost any type of communication within UX, uh, is sharing the benefits of how this is going to benefit that user and what benefits they're providing to others is a very strong motivator. So a lot of people like to feel like they've just had a hand in it. Somebody listened to them mm -hmm. and that they're being they're being heard. And and uh, that's that's huge. In, in so many of these instances, I've talked to users who were reticent to even give their opinion because they just didn't think anyone was listening. So that was that's just a really big, uh, you know, we used to call these soft skills. I think they're more mm -hmm. considered core skills now about making the users comfortable, making them know that you're on their side, even if even though you conduct yourself in a in a more uh, you know a, a more neutral manner, the fact that they're there and that you're learning for them yeah. is, is a very powerful motivator to get people to really engage and get past that shyness or sometimes fear if you're you know mm. dealing with people. Yeah, no, that's a really they're good. They're afraid that their feedback is going to be heard by someone who's going to punish them for it, and just really making all that clear: the privacy is there. Um, the what they're doing is really going to help, and um, and then just giving them time to share their piece. Yeah, no. no, yeah, no. Thanks for sharing that, Nicole. Sometimes um, it is right, like um, you know, engaged customers might also want to play a part in how the future shaping the future direction of your products. Yeah, I also see Denisha asking if uh, if uh, they can build onto that. If you want, feel free to unmute yourself and join the conversation and build on this thought. And thank you, Nicole, Hello. for sharing. Hi. Yeah, hi. So just to add on to that, I really like what Nicole said when it comes to like making sure the users feel heard. What I like to do, I uh, recently conducted like five or so usability studies moderated. I like to build a relationship with them. I like to say, you know, how was your day? How are you doing? Just talk to me how you feel. Walk me through this process. What are you thinking about? I like to build like a kind of small talk communication with participants and they're just more comfortable or we find like somewhere we're similar and they're just like hey Denicia this and that is great I'm like oh okay so tell me more you know when you build that connection with people instead of just being like you know um do this do that and you're just kind of bland with it they're more willing to share more about themselves and thus more willing to talk which I find really helps so it just derives being more of like welcoming you know when it comes to users thank you janisha for sharing uh and contributing to this conversation i will be wrapping it up because we this is not the last time we keep uh, talking we will be having also more discussions and kind of group activities so um uh, we will have more chances also to discuss and share. But for now, I just want to say uh, thank you to Christina for sh uh, like sharing how you think about uh, creative research techniques and also giving us examples and kind of tools that we can kind of go out and think, can we apply it to our research question? Does it fit and kind of get ideas on that? Um, and now I just want to give the floor also to Karin, who will also introduce us to how she thinks about creative research techniques and uh, how she defines them and uh, help, will help us also practice uh, some of them while uh, meeting each other. Uh, so um, Karin, just to quickly introduce her, is a UX researcher with over 20 years of experience in UX research, and she's also the founder of UX Insight. And Karen also happens to be the trainer of a creative um, interview and techniques training. So uh, that's why she's also contributing today here on this topic. So take it away, Karen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Christina, for sharing your story. Um, it was very uh, interesting. I, I wrote down the Venn di diagram. I didn't know that exercise myself. It's always nice to learn something. Um, so before uh, we, before you registered for this meetup, we asked you all one question. Um, and the question was, what other techniques besides asking open-ended quest questions have you tried to get deeper research insight? Uh, so I want to share with you uh, what the, the community uh, gave as answers. And it was very interesting to take a look. Um, good to mention first is that we excluded from this uh, word cloud user testing and surveys. Uh, since we assume that most of us are familiar with using those methods. But still, if you look at them, uh, we receive more than 70 different types of methods and techniques. So that was amazing. 
uh, most mentioned were observations, and that can be both field observations or observing users performing tasks in a test setting. And other methods mentioned very uh, more often were diary studies, journals, card sorting. Um, I also saw some techniques I never heard before, like Kaizen or vignettes. So if the person sharing those uh, uh, are here, I would love to learn more about them. And um, yeah, there, there, there's a lot of interesting stuff uh, in here. For the remaining of this meetup, I would like to dive into creative techniques that you can do that you can use during an interview. So not specifically uh, like methods, but something you can do during an interview. And there are some examples in here, like uh, the five whys or uh, um, ratings or mind mapping, lettering, or like the Venn diagram shared by Christina. Um, and I want to sh share some more with you. Uh, first, a short um, definition of what I mean with creative interviewing techniques in this context. So uh, what I mean is every technique we can use as moderators during an interview, except for asking just a straight question. And we can uh, take from the arts like modeling, drawing, pasting, acting, and also ask specific type of questions, projecting. Um, first, uh, as mentioned by Christina as well, it's good to always remember uh, not to be creative just for the sake of create creativity, although sometimes it's, it's more fun for people to do, and that can also be a goal. But uh, there might be different reasons why we, as UX researchers, want to uh, turn to creative interviewing techniques. I will not dive in. Uh, very deep into them, but you might recognize some of them, like um, you want to know more about deep motivations and you, you suspect that people might not uh, be aware of their motivations or you want to understand more about certain behavior and you think there's a risk of cognitive biases or um, maybe you want to learn more about deep emotions or multi-layered concepts like friendship or uh, loneliness. Um, and lastly, also important to consider, uh, sometimes you want uh, to use these techniques not per se to obtain the insights, but also to share them later with your stakeholders. And you might want uh, some rich data, so like images, uh, quotes, uh, videos, etc., to have more impact in your story building. So one of the uh, things, one of the uh, things we like to do during our meetups is also meet with other researchers. Um, so we like to combine the two in one and use one of the creative techniques to uh, network with other researchers. And for this, I um, want to ask you to pick one item. So maybe you're in the office, maybe you're at home, maybe you're uh, somewhere else, but take a look around and pick one item that says something about you. Um, so maybe it's uh, something you're wearing, it's maybe something that's on your desk, it's a book you're reading or something you're eating or dr drinking, maybe it's a picture on your phone. It doesn't really matter as long as it tells something about you. I like to inter uh, ask you to introduce yourself by telling, uh, the, telling the story of the item you picked. Why did you pick it and what does it mean to you? Um, does anyone like to share their experience with this technique right now? How did it feel? I'm happy to talk if I don't have to show my face. Sure. <laughs> That's Anya sorry. for sure. Yes, sorry. I have a cold and I look horrific. I showed myself to the two people that were in my group and I think that was revealing enough. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, but I'm happy to share. 
So um, I thought it was really good because um, immediately we had something that we could relate to with each other. Um, so one, one of the people in my group showed something where like I had a similar thing, not on my desk, but I knew about it uh, and the other person as well. So, so that was really good. And I think um, the, the sharing also was quite personal um, and immediately, I, I don't know, I felt there was a connection and we were like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know this and I remember this and, and that's really nice of you to do this. And yeah, so it, it was really good uh, for, for from that perspective. Yeah, so if you compare it to the normal, please introduce yourself. Um, what do you think it provides uh, extra? More personal touch and a story about the person. Yeah. Anyone else has a different experience or something to add to that? I can go. I want, want to add on that. Um, it, it was yeah. uh, it was a great icebreaker, or what do we call them now? Generizers, energizers, um, because it uh, no one had to really kind of sit there and go, oh, what do I say about myself? And you know, it was I think people were able to choose their objects very quickly and tell pretty good stories about them. So uh, in a very short period of time, I don't know how long that that session even was, I was able to find commonalities. Uh, to be intrigued by their histories. And it definitely piqued my interest in both of them. So I, I've had so many more questions that we couldn't get to. I thought that was, I thought it was great. Yeah. Yeah, I can go next. Um, I basically connected with everyone in my group because I had two people who really love books. I have people who love tea. Um, I believe it's Marianne, Tsunami, and... Um, uh, I know Marion, she showed her dog, which was super cute. I love animals. I'm a complete dog lover. But um, what I had linked with is um, one person, they showed their bookshelf. I showed this book that taught me how to network. So it's called Never Eve Alone, if I can just drop this by Keith Rossi. Really useful in just letting you know how to network with people because I'm more of a face-to-face -face talker. I've been learning more how to network virtually. So um, it was great to hear from my other group mates just what basically expired them. It just shows a lot about of a person, the first item that you would pick in your room. Yeah. So it's all with that. that. That's great to hear. That's great to hear. That's actually also my experience in using this te technique. And if if you look at uh, what my, was mentioned before, that sometimes it takes a lot of time to prepare more the the more in depth research. This is this is an exercise that, that actually doesn't take a lot of time to prepare and you can use it as an icebreaker or as a sensitizer. Um, and sometimes you want to maybe narrow the type of question, the, the type of item down. So for example, I once did research on uh, shopping behavior of uh, women in a certain age group and I asked them to share with me their favorite piece of clothing and uh, that really evoked a lot of storytelling and also gave me more insight in yeah, what they really liked and and and, and shared about themselves so um, I want to move to uh, one more exercise um, and um, I want to ask you all to take one topic in mind uh, which we want to learn more about and that's cooking and uh, it's cooking or um, the, the the place cooking takes in into your life the activity what does it mean to you what i will do next is show you a list with words uh, you can take all a minute or so to read all the words and then select three words that you somehow associate with cooking or the role that cooking plays in your life. Uh, maybe you would like to write the words down because next step is that um, we divide you in groups again and um, you are going to share, if you are up to it, uh, share your story around cooking using the three words. So if I hope that's clear. Um, because now I will share the list of words and please take your time to read them and pick three words. Mm -hmm. 
So um, before we go to the final discussion, uh, where if you want to share your experiences with this exercise, you can do so as well. Um, I want to um, tell you a bit more about what this exercise was about. So what I did was um, I created a random word of a uh, random list of words, and I used random words generator for this. Um, and the idea is that by picking different words that doesn't that don't um, explicitly have a connection to the topic of mind, your your mind gets more uh, free in associate association. So if I would have picked a list of words like kitchen, um, food, uh, family, then you probably would all end up with the same sort of story. But by using different words that maybe are not really related to the word cooking, um, you open up the mind of people and, and create different stories. So there is another thing you can use uh, word associations for. It's uh, maybe you know it as a product reaction cards. Um, uh, Microsoft created a list of 118 adjectives you can use um, to ask people to respond to a project product or, or a topic. Um, and then it's more about how they feel towards the topic. Uh, most of the people uh, that I, most of the researchers will probably not use all 100, 118 words because it's a lot of words for people to digest, but um, take a smaller set of words and um, find uh, opinions. It, it's good to, to stress that these are not quantitative research methods. It's qualitative. It's uh, used as a conversation starter and not as a quantitative measure of, of how people feel. So um, we briefly touched upon two creative techniques. There are, uh, well, as mentioned before, this group already shared like 70. Uh, there are more out there. Um, I can talk uh, the rest of the evening about them, uh, at least the ones I know, and I would love to learn more about that as well. But unfortunately, we only have like seven minutes left. Um, so I want to take that time uh, for some last uh, Q&A. Maybe you have some questions or final thoughts uh, or anything you would like to share on this topic. Yeah, well, um, I, 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 yeah, I can say something. Um, I, I, I like the. Um, uh, I, well, thank you, uh, thank you for the for the for your for your talk and your for both presentations. Uh, um, I, I like the 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 exercises that you gave. You know that they're so very simple. So there, it's not like when you started out, you said like creative. Sometimes sometimes people are you know uh, sort of uh, you know impressed by that by that uh, word. And um, I like that this, these are very simple creative solutions. You don't even notice that that it's that, that there's creativity uh, uh, going on because they're so short. And yeah, I love that. I love the simplicity uh, of it. But, uh, yeah, that's yeah. my mind working. Like how we how how can I use it not just in user research but in other feel, uh, in other um, activities uh, with my with my work uh, as well. Yeah, that's great to hear. Yeah, yeah I, th I think so as well. Uh, and if, if you have like, you can do the same with images or, or you, you can have like this toolbox of simple exercises you can use during interviews or uh, during surveys or, or to, to prepare, uh, do some, some homework tasks. Uh, yeah. And it's also what I find people really enjoy mm -hmm. uh, doing, uh, participating in these techniques. So it's it's yeah. also about fun and creating engagement. Um, yeah, that's also what I like about it. Yeah, and I, I want to try. I'm, 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 I'm doing user research uh, from a distance uh, uh, for the past couple of weeks with very serious users, with policymakers. But I'm, I'm going to try to do these exercises like 
pick a product from your room, you know, because they're also working at, at home and just see if it works. Just try if, if it, if it uh, works, if know. It's very serious user. Yeah. I just going to try. Yeah. I would love to know. I'll let if you know. It works. <laughs> Great. Anyone else something to share? I uh, would like to say something. Um, actually, I want to uh, uh, say also, like the other ones, that the simplicity of these thing, of these methods or of these these tools, is is absolutely unbelievable and um, very very effective. Um, and uh, I actually used similar ones, and I can only recommend. That's something that I would like to add uh, to. Um, what uh, was said um, that similar exercises can also be used to um, break the mm, I don't know, the strange feeling when you have a workshop so in facilitation um, mm -hmm. and it 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 really it really helps um, a lot so it, I I really appreciate it I would like to ask if there is somewhere a summary or like a collection of these methods uh, that uh, we might access or um, if I don't know, somebody has some more ideas, maybe they want to share them uh, somewhere. We made a lot yeah, of we, connections. So we, we can share we can share the mind map we created on the on, on the basis of this really nice. community for starters. Um, we actually do have a like a sort of a summary book uh, from our training. Um, and uh, I created a training with uh, Mike and Mark and we once discussed maybe it's good to have this um to to publish this book but it's not yet there so you should you should yeah, publish a booklet if not you know like yeah it's a simple uh, yeah, exactly yeah. because it's 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 too bad that we we you know not not everybody gets so creative you know we can adapt a, uh, adopt a lot of techniques um in our work um, you know maybe we we don't think about creating techniques yeah and it's it's also nice if if maybe this uh, like Yvonne told I want to try this in a slightly different way and that maybe if she will share it again with with us that exactly yeah, that helps us build and, and that's a sort of an iteration no yeah yeah exactly yeah exactly thank you again all right okay I think we're um almost um run out of time so i want to uh thank you all for I just one last comment i'm sorry, sorry yeah i'm sorry yeah. i just wanted to jump in with one last thing um as i told my workout buddies um i've been in this industry for quite a long time and i've been frankly a little concerned that i was sitting on my laurels that i uh uh had been a little stuck in my ways in terms of the the activities and the approach that i have and this is actually really helpful um, it was nice to see some of what I'm already doing validated, of course, by other people. Um, but I think that the attention to to pulling out to to to, to moving people into a reflective mind space uh, is really effective. And and as you say, so simple. Um, I'm just thrilled to be reminded of all of this. So thank you so much. Oh, that's so nice to hear, Nicole. Thank you for sharing that with us. So. Um... With that, I would like to invite you all that if you try one of the techniques or you have a different techniques, I would love to learn more about it. So uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I would love to connect. Um, and uh, some uh, little marketing from our site. If you want to uh, keep, uh, want to be updated about our uh, activities like this news uh, meetups and other things. Uh, maybe you can subscribe to our newsletter. We share more information. Yeah, it was lovely to meet you all. I agree. And um, I hope to see you uh, again in the future. Yeah, and I want to give also once again a shout out to Christina as well for sharing kind of yes. her way of thinking about creative uh, research approaches. It's nice also to see how like different researchers think about it differently and also have different examples so that you just take them as inspiration. And uh, let's all uh, stay in touch. Let's connect on LinkedIn. 
uh, and um, let's uh, exchange with uh, this kind of also simple or not so simple techniques that uh, we can try out in our kind of next uh, projects uh, going ahead.